I'm just going to ask you, if you don't mind, just to move forward a little bit, because we're less now than we were in the previous uh, session. So I think it will, it will feel probably more cosy if we were all kind of close together. Just drawing on that comment that Kara made about um, body heat. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so just, just a reminder on what we said earlier about the fire alarm. Um, there's no tests uh, scheduled for today. So if we hear it, we just uh, calmly leave um, and then just turn right. And we will find two uh, staff members from uh, Mark Birmingham that will actually um, lead us to safety. Hope it won't happen. Um, Welcome to those again watching on the live stream and those in the studio. Hope you enjoyed lunch. I find it really tasty. Um, for those who are actually watching us as well and they want to tweet, please use the hashtag Coptimism. And for any questions, please add at Julie's Bicycle. Um, and a reminder as well of the loose who are on the same way to safety if there is a fire alarm. Um, so I'm just going to say thank you to both Stephanie, Sir, and Jatinder Burma. Um, Stephanie is the Chief Executive of Nottingham Playhouse, and Jatinder is the Artistic Director of Tara Arts. And we're going to start with uh, Stephanie, who is going to tell us about the recent capital investment and the results uh, that they got, which were very positive. Just actually before that, I'm going to just I'm just going to say a few words about you. Uh, Stephanie sir, uh, has been chief executive of Nottingham Playhouse, one of the UK's leading producing theatres since 2001. Before this, she ran Blackpool Grand Theatre for five years and the Merlin Theatre from it for two. She has programmed this. Um, sorry. She's also worked as an, as an actress for five years and as a stage manager for two and has been variously a, th a theatre critic, uh, court reporter and comedy club compare. Very, very roles <laughs> there. <laughs> She's also a vice chair of Nottingham Strategic Cultural Partnership. She's also produced over 100 shows over the last 15 years in Nottingham and, a tour, and on tour. She's fundraised and co-project managed four capital projects during her career, so we have a real professional and a lot of expertise in the room. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks so much for, for asking me, Julie's Bicycle. I'm delighted to be here. Um, yes, uh, expert, no. <laughs> Plenty of experience, yes. Um, just to give you a, a kind of snapshot of Nottingham Playhouse, um, Nottingham Playhouse was built in 1962-63. It was one of the wave of um, theatre building that went on that was a mark of a bold new society where everyone would access the arts. Very important movement in theatre building. Nottingham was one of the first. Um, and architecturally, um, a key uh, element for Peter Morrow was the idea that you could see in. Really important that theatres were no longer these things which were closed off, but they were things where every person and probably every man in 1962-63 could see in and you could see there was no mystery, it was all available for you. It was for you, the, the person in the street, the man on the Clapham omnibus, etc. Um, problem with that is it's terribly environmentally unfriendly. So prior to coming to Nottingham, I'd run uh, Blackpool Grand, which is a Frank Matcham, and the Frank Matcham built in... 19, 1894, I should know this, was actually much more environmentally friendly than Nottingham Playhouse built in 1962-63. Um, we were talking earlier about concrete. Concrete. Nottingham Playhouse. It's cast concrete, loads of concrete, um, single glazed uh, glass everywhere. So um, my starting point for what I'm going to tell you is actually Julie's bicycle. I'm not just saying that because they've invited me here this afternoon. Um, we, as a company, we were pretty good at um, being environmentally friendly. We were pretty good at recycling. We, we were producing house, so we make scenery, we make costumes, um, we drive about a lot, we tour. We were really, really mindful of what we were doing. We were very good at turning off lights. Um, we'd already installed Power Perfector, and we knew that that was generating a lot of savings. Um, and Julie's Bicycle came and gave a talk to the Big Ten in Bristol in about 2010, might have been early 2011, I think it's 2010. And I had a kind of eureka moment, which was that there's only so much we can do as people. We've now reached the point where the, we, people say, look at your people first. We've done the people. 
Um, and I knew that we had to look at the building to get the rest of the savings. And it was in an environment where we were having so many funding cuts. I'm sure we've all been there. We're all still there. It's going to keep going. Um, so we knew we had to save money. So the first thing that we did was to recognise that we didn't know anything about it. Chile's bicycle came and gave us talk, and I realised how little I knew about the subject um, and realised that we had to get together like-minded people in the organisation to, to make a team to take this forward. I had no idea then just how bad we were. So what the first thing, one of the first things we did was we linked up with Future Factory, um, led by Professor Amin El Habebi, which is based at Nottingham Trent University. And they run a special unit that's all about these technologies. And they thermal imaged the theatre. Um, and unusually for theatre, theatre's quite you know, over the top, it's quite out there, but you don't want bright pink when you're being thermal imaged, I realised. And uh, Nottingham Playhouse glowed bright pink on the thermal imaging, and we were heating the night sky very generously. Um, so clearly we had to do something about this. Um, we, had, we accessed great advice early on, and I think that was really important. And the advice wasn't from people who would make money out of it. And I think we've all been in a situation where someone comes to sell you the thing they've invented or the thing that they're responsible for selling. And it's one of the reasons why everyone's got PV panels, whether or not they're in the optimum position to have those. Um, so it was great to have that impartial advice um, and that partnership with, with Nottingham Trent University. Um, not everyone at the Playhouse at a senior level at that point was really begging to do this project, to be honest. And one of the things I realised is you have to identify people in your organisation who are up for it. Now, everyone's up for it. But at that point, we had quite a few naysayers who we can't afford it, will never raise the money, it will never pay for itself, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we had a little bit of a pr problem because having decided it ha you can't unknow this. Once you've done thermal imaging of your building and you've seen just how bad you are, you can't unsee that picture. You then have to do something about it. You know? So uh, we had to move forward. Um, also, we're a charity. We're an arts organisation and we're a charity. And the idea that we'd be spending money on heating and uh, lighting Nottingham as opposed to spending it on arts was kind of fundamentally at odds with what we existed to do. So... Um, the first things we did, how, how did we start? I know nothing about this, so I didn't at the time. I don't know that much now, to be honest. Um, how did we start? We did an audit. So we audited all the things we could do to our building. I mean, everything, a wish list. What would you do if you possibly could? We audited the whole building in terms of what would make it uh, less energy inefficient, really. Um, and we ended up with this massive shopping list of all the things that you could do to a building to make that work. And going back to what I think Steve was saying earlier, you don't have to do it all. You have to do what you can do. Um, and what we realised very early on is that some of those things were quick wins, return on investment was very, very quick, um, and they weren't terribly disruptive. And some of the elements of the project we, we haven't done yet, and we might do them in the fullness of time, but we haven't done them yet because... The aim was to get started. Once you know you're losing money and your carbon footprint is appalling, you have to do something about it. So we identified our quick wins, and um, they were really, really dull. We had to fundraise for this, and it's really boring. I don't know if you've tried fundraising for environmental upgrades, because it's not a new building. You know, if you're building a new building, that's one thing. When you're upgrading the one you have, it, people don't really tend to put their hand in their pocket. So we had no money at all. Um, we had a project that was going to cost at least a million pounds um, and no visible means of making those two things talk to each other. And it didn't really matter how many times we said to each other, um, the insulation is very important. No one said, I must give you some money to help you with that. Um, so we had a, a bit of a problem there. So we did the feasibility. We knew what we wanted to do. We then, and it comes back to a point I was making earlier about the local authority, our, our building is owned by Nottingham City Council. Um, and, of course, all local authorities have a responsibility of their own to be environmentally friendly, to be forward-looking, to reduce their carbon impact. So um, it was a case of then taking it back to the city council and saying, OK, you own this building, we operate this building. The way the building was constructed in, 19, in the early 1960s is, of its very nature, inefficient. So we have got to do something about it. You'd have that responsibility whether we were doing it or whether you were doing it. Because we're an arts organisation, we're eligible to apply for funding to support this, but we will need match funding. Um, and then what the City Council did, and the City Council have no money. I mean, any of us who uh, work for organisations that are funded in particular by, by Labour local authorities, they have no money. <laughs> so there was no money. 
but the only way to move this forward was for them to um, try and find a way to fulfil their own obligation uh, and assist the Playhouse in securing major external investment into a, into a resource that they owned. And that came through uh, waiving our rent for a period of 13 years. So all of that rent waiving went forward as match funding. So having obtained the funding um, from them, that also helped other people. We got one major donor who gave us, I think, 40,000, which was extremely welcome. We did a lot of waving buckets at people, and they did a lot of resisting them. <laughs> they really weren't up for it. Um, and eventually, we did put in some of the savings as match funding for the Arts Council uh, large-scale uh, project fund because we just couldn't get all the money raised. So we went forward knowing that we were going to save the money, knowing that as soon as this work happened, it was going to show dividends, or at least really hoping so. So the bid was based on sustainability um, in every sense. So the bid to the Arts Council was also about how we generate money. It was also about our joy per kilowatt. That's the most fantastic uh, equation I've seen. That's exactly what it is. If you have a building, you're heating it and you're lighting it and you're opening the doors, do as much as you can with that building with every square foot. So the project was the things that you would expect, double glazing, secondary glazing, um, roof insulation like you've never seen. <laughs> um, our roof is now like a bouncy castle. It's so heavily insulated. Um, PV panels, not because we had a particular yen for them, but because they were the visible sign of this whole thing that people get. So it was like verisimilitude in environmental terms. If you have PV panels, you're obviously doing something right. Um, and, uh, you know, we completely clad our fly tower, we completely insulated the, the auditorium, um, and so on and so forth. So everywhere where heat was escaping was kind of clad. Um, but we also created more performance spaces and usable spaces within our footprint. So we've now got three pods, and the pods are within the footprint. They're used for meetings, they're used for small-scale events, they're hireable, and they it's just like extra free money, because like many of those buildings of the 60s, you've got these huge... Uh, foyers that you don't necessarily need, whereas the Victorian ones tend to have smaller foyers where you're all a bit more crushed together. The 60s, you know, the places like the National and so forth, they have these massive open foyers. You don't need all that space. So the idea was to be sustainable as well as uh, in every sense, not just environmentally. Um, it was really tough in terms of heritage. We're a grade two star listed building. The longest and most complicated conversation we had in the whole process was about double versus secondary glazing on our windows <clears throat> with heritage wanting us to have uh, secondary glazing and us needing to have double glazing. And that conversation went on for about six or seven weeks and we got a funding, up, uh, not funding, up, planning consent turned down twice on that basis. Well, we were trying to get this work done. Um, and obviously, they're responsible for conserving the, the facility, but there wasn't another way of doing it. And now it's in. It to it's totally invisible, which is another problem about raising money for environmental stuff. You can't see any of it. You know, we've got door lobbies that have cut our energy loss massively. You've got the secondary and double glazing and this totally invisible insulation and roof cladding. Hmm, how exciting. You know, you can really see how someone would get off on that. Um, so the conservation was an issue with us being listed. Um, the questions about the problems disappeared. It looks absolutely great. Um, but going back to what was said earlier, there's still a list of things that we have yet to do. There's a whole list of things we can do. We didn't do grey water, for example. We couldn't find a way to make that worth it, but at some point it probably will do. We run a wardrobe department. We're constantly washing co costumes and so on and so forth. We run a paint shop that's constantly washing out brushes. There must be a way... Of, of squaring that, but we haven't found it yet. One of our biggest energy savings across the whole piece, and this only really applies if you're a theatre, was replacing our old um, inefficient theatre lanterns with modern ones. And that wasn't even replacing them with LED, it was just replacing them with the, the best that existed at that point. Because not only are they more energy efficient, but they create a better and more flexible lighting state on a fraction of the energy use. So you have old lamps that might need to go up to five to get the same imp um, impact that you get from two on a new lamp. So that was a real eye-opener. We had thought we'd have to wait for LED, for LED to be as flexible as it can be. I know some people use LED on stage now, and a lot of people don't. For us, we were waiting and waiting for LED, and then we said, actually, do you know what? We can achieve so much here. The savings uh, in cash terms from replacing our lantern stock is 10 grand a year. You know, so you may as well just do it, because <laughs> as soon as you do it, you start saving. Um, we had a really bitty, scrappy project. Um, we had um, 
really nice people and some less nice people involved, to be absolutely honest, even though this is live streamed, I'm going to say it. Um, we had uh, an internal project manager and an external project manager, which was essential. Um, we had so many subcontractors on site because we actually had three different companies just doing the glazing because we had the specialists that could do the double glazing, the size and scale of our biggest windows. We had the secondary glazers and we had some other company for doing another kind of glazing that I've never worked out what it was really. We had all sorts of hiccups. We had all sorts of clashes. We had the roof leaked eight times, nine times, I think, while it was being replaced. It was, you know, it is, it is a... Um, mark of a retrofit that you've got lots of people on site at the same time doing completely different things that don't necessarily fit together as well as they might but we kept budget we kept more or less to time it all came good in the end the only real low point was when we when the arts council came for their tour around to see where their money had gone and we realized that someone had double gla a secondary glazed a broken window <laughs> yay um so that wasn't a great moment but but by and large it all worked together um and we then reached the kind of unveiling. And again, the unveiling is also completely invisible because really what you're doing with your unveiling is you're coming back with your thermal imagery, you're taking the pictures again and you're seeing where you've got. And the pink had disappeared. It had completely worked <clears throat> across the whole piece. And then you look at your energy use and you're saving upwards of £40,000 a year on your energy bills from where you were. And it's not been so hard, you know, to do. It's been really, really bitty. Um, but it's been really impressive. And now people see it, even people who beforehand were like, oh, whatever. You know, they're like, we can do this, this is great. And now it's where do we go next? So um, we're working again with Future Factory at, the, at Nottingham Trent University. We're really, really fortunate to have them on our doorstep. Um, we're also working in partnership with the City Council again. We'll hope to work in partnership with the Arts Council again, but obviously that's a bit presumptuous. We're looking at things like... Um, humidity, how the building's actually used, you can get totally obsessed with it. You know, most of our heat now, as someone was saying earlier, I think you were saying, comes from the audience. It doesn't come from heating. The heating is off for a vast percentage of the year, vast majority of the year, there's no heating. But the only thing you're really doing is using the theatre lamps. So that's massive. That's a huge change. It's much more comfortable. We do need to work out now how to get rid of some of the heat in the summer, but that's the next project. But now we're dealing with what people, how they behave, where they go, which windows. When we come to do the heat dumping, which windows will we open? How will that work best? It's just on. It's an endlessly fascinating process. Um, and like many of us, you know, we display our energy use front of house so people can see that as a charity, we're behaving in a way that we should be doing. We're recipients of public funding. We're recipients of people's donation. Every penny we can spend on our core activity, that's where it should be going, not on our energy bills. Um, I was asked to think about two, uh, three things of, three things, three pieces of advice. Um, the first one would be to do the thing with the biggest bang for the buck. So whatever it is, and however unsexy it is as a project, if insulation is your thing, you need to do your insulation. Um, and the sooner you do it, you can't unknow your problem. The sooner you do it, the sooner you start saving. So you may as well get on with it. Um, and energy is not going to get cheaper. And uh, you just have to do it. You have to get started. And you have to accept as a company and your board need to accept and your staff need to accept that doing nothing is not an option. Irrespective of whether the Arts Council need you to or anyone else, doing nothing is not an option. So um, do the thing with the biggest bang for the buck first. Do it in stages if you can't afford to do it all in one go. Take advice from people that know what they're talking about. I still don't completely know what I'm talking about, but I know lots of people that do. Um, and uh, people are very willing. If they're passionate about their subject, they're really willing to give you their time and their help and their expertise. Particularly helpful if you have a university nearby. But even if you don't, and obviously always get your advice from people that don't get a financial kickback in the advice that they're giving you. Because we had all sorts of... Uh, was it was it green bling he described it as? We had all sorts of claims made for all sorts of technologies that wouldn't have worked for us at all. Um, and the third one, I think, is, you know, about fundraising. If you can't raise money for it, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. You should look at your cash flow. You should work out about when the savings will come through. You should talk to your bank. You should talk to whoever. Because doing nothing isn't an option, and because every day you're not doing it, you're costing yourself money. Um, you sometimes have to deal um, in financial terms with people who go, but we can't afford it. You can't afford not to. So you have to try and find that way. If you're fortunate like we are and you can um, do a deal with your local authority, so much the better. But even if you can't, look at the green grants making, look at the savings. There are sometimes local authority organisations, uh, sorry, local authority advisors 
who will give you interest-free loans and that sort of thing. The power perfecter, I think, paid for itself in 18 months. Um, and this is generating, as I say, you know, tens of thousands of pounds every year. And those savings will only improve as energy costs go higher. So I just say go for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Very interesting. Um, lots of uh, interesting um, um, messages that we can discuss later. Um, so I would like now to introduce Jatinder Verma, which is the artistic director of uh, Tara Arts. Before I actually go into um, reading a bit of his bio, I would like to say congratulations for that stage uh, sustainability award that you won um, in January, um, which is very impressive. Um, so Jatinda was born in Tanzania and grew up in Nairobi, Kenya. Migrated to Britain in 1968 um, and co-founded Tara Arts in 1977. He remains its artistic director, developing a unique cross-cultural theatre style where Asian theatre sensibilities meet European drama. In 1990, Jatinder became the first Asian director at the National Theatre, staging his own adaptation of Molière's Tartuffe. I'm sorry about my French. Um, author of several published uh, articles and contributes regularly to radio and TV on both arts and current affairs programmes. He's also written and presented several radio documentary programmes. He holds uh, honorary doctorates from Exeter, York, and the Manford University, and it's a fellow of the Rose uh, Bradford College. Um, recently, I believe as well that you uh, implemented a capital uh, program investment, and um, yeah, we would like to hear a little bit more about it and the successes and challenges. From here. Yes, so you have this. Yeah, okay, fine. And the presentation is great. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, th thank you for, for inviting me, and thank you very much, Stephanie, for, for you know, getting the afternoon going. Uh, and I can't echo enough what you said uh, that uh, doing nothing is not an option. Uh, uh, just taking the kind of first point, why? Why sustainability? And um, uh, our DNA for the last 40 years, and hopefully that's not the last 40 years, it'll carry on for the next 40 years, has been to create a kind of sustainable multicultural theater company. Uh, and for those of you who are in the arts, and all of you are, you will know how challenging that is. And therefore, um, environmental sustainability seemed to us a kind of natural extension uh, of a project that we had been involved in anyway. And it became very apparent um, in 2006, I think, uh, that we really need to do something. The theater that we'd inherited uh, uh, is, was built not as a theater, but as a meeting place for railway workers when the railway station, uh, which is next to us, was opened. The station was opened in 1884. It's the main line train from Waterloo to Portsmouth. Uh, and the authorities, whoever they were at the time, decided that they wanted to keep the uh, workers away from demon drink, and so wanted to create a mission hall where people could gather for better things than just drink. Uh, over time, the mission hall, uh, what was added to the mission hall uh, was a mace net. Uh, and that's really what we inherited. Uh, just before us, uh, that building which had been uh, built uh, around 1896 uh, ha was a church. It was a church of a migrant community, a community of West Indians, um, a, a church of the Nazarene. Um, uh, so the ground floor was a church, which is where people gathered, and upstairs, uh, which was the masonet, is where the 
priest lived. Uh, and his two children were born in what became then our offices. Uh, so that was a sort of history of this building. Um, and I think I might be, if I move it the right way, oh gosh, no. This is going to be one of those. One of the most um, first lessons I learned in theater was Asians and technology. They don't mix. <laughs> I learned it here in Birmingham. <laughs> okay. All right, let's do it that way. I can sit here and you tell me. So, uh, this is the kind of frontage that, that we have uh, in our part of Earthfield. And that corner over there um, was what our theatre was. Uh, basically, all we'd done was just sort of give it a whitewash. Um, and uh, uh, what used to be a shop front was our foyer. And the mission hall was more or less the same as it had been in 1896. Uh, so we start with that, and I'll kind of quickly, this is the kind of background of it. By the turn of this century, the thing was just sort of falling apart, really. Uh, you can't quite see, but if you look at the window up there, the whole thing is sloping. It's, you know, as if the, the building was saying, right, I need to go back to my roots, which is into the embankment. <laughs> Uh, and the embankment really is right next door to us. Uh, so that was a sort of uh, thing that we'd, uh, we'd inherited and worked with and loved. And what was fascinating about it was that it was a surprise even to those people who were constantly coming into the building. The surprise was that you had this sort of relatively scuzzy high street. You came off the station, uh, you entered through this red door, and lo and behold, there was a theater behind it. Uh, and so there was this sort of feeling of a, of a kind of TARDIS. And that's an idea that we'd kept very much in our head. Uh, so if we just moved on. And that just gives you a kind of sense of, of the blueprint that, that there was there. And one of the sort of um, key drivers into rethinking this building and reimagining it also so that it's environmentally friendly, uh, was my designer, uh, Claudia Mayer. And Claudia had um, uh, grown up in India and had a lot of connections with all sorts of artists, and particularly uh, architects in India, and was very excited by certain ways in which they were using materials uh, in the kind of modern uh, buildings that they were creating, whether in Delhi or Bombay or... or parts of South India. Uh, and I, on my part, was obsessed with an earth floor. Uh, and part of the obsession was that, uh, as far as I was concerned, all theatre, wherever it was, started on the earth floor, was under the shade of a tree. That's the beginnings of all storytelling. And I was very keen that somehow we get this earth floor into uh, this building. And from that began to spark ideas of earth, brick, and wood are the sort of very key components of uh, what we might uh, dream up. So if we just move on. Uh, uh, this was at this kind of stage where we'd gone through a variety of architects, including very importantly, uh, Steve Tonkins of Alf Tonkins, and he had been very important in uh, helping us th think through the initial feasibility for this project. Uh, and then eventually we went with uh, Julian Middleton of uh, EDAS. Uh, and part of the whole kind of brief was that somehow we want to create a space where we are intimately involved in the design process as much as in the construction process. Um, we don't want to be remained separate from it. We will want to control it as much as possible. Um, and Julian, to his great credit, was very open to, to that possibility. Um, so if we just sort of move on to it. Uh, and one of the things that made it possible was this, on the left you see this photograph of this manky piece of land. Uh, this was a little strip. It's about five meters by five meters. Um, right next to the embankment, it's a strip of land that Network Rail owns. 
throughout the country, every half mile, there is that kind of a strip of land. They have to have that by statute uh, in order to, in case there's an emergency, they have an access to, to the ground. So the real question became, how can we prize this piece of land from them? Uh, we were very fortunate that our local MP uh, is now the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, uh, but also that the local borough was extremely supportive of this uh, idea of redeveloping the theatre, in part because they were very keen on this particular part of southwest London uh, having some form of a revival. Uh, so we got into a lot of negotiations with Network Rail. And of course, Network Rail initially said, no, forget it, there's no way you're going to have it. And then changed their tune when once we said to them, look, we don't want to build a structure on it. We'll turn it into a garden. Uh, we need to have access to it. It will mean that our foyer can expand, but we will not have a permanent structure. We will also furnish you with a gate so in an emergency, your truck can come in. Um, we will create paving uh, or in that piece of land so your trucks can actually stand on, on, uh, on that piece of land, whereas at the moment they can't. So eventually through all that discussion, they agreed. And that made possible by the fact that we were able to expand slightly towards uh, the embankment. It made the rest of the thing possible. At the very least, what it did was that throughout the construction period, that strip of land is where all the lorries were. That was the only way in which they could get the cranes in and everything else that needed to come in on site. So, um, so this was the sort of initial thought of it. Uh, and at one stage, you know, at the kind of early stages, we were also thinking of ways in which you could possibly spill out into the courtyard. Uh, and then we have the theater space like that. Uh, and very important to us was the fact that we needed to have one thing which the original building did not allow us to have, which was a, a, an R&D space, a workshop space, a rehearsal space, so a kind of secondary space. So that was really important, and that could only happen on, on an upper level, so I would give up office spaces. Oh, yeah. And that just gives you a kind of cross-section of what, what it would be. Now, when it came to fundraising, and this is, I will get to it, what no one funds you for, of course, is the foundations. Uh, the basement proved to be the real big problem. We needed to go down. In fact, we've now gone down 14 meters to hold the entire structure up. Um, but also to take a lot of our services down into the basement. Uh, but that was the one thing that, uh, you know, the, particularly the Arts Council, which was one of our major funders, kept on saying, well, you know, who's going to see the basement? And, you know, it's not exactly a kind of public view and so on and so, on and so forth. Uh, we had to, as part of the whole exercises that we all end up doing, which is trying to kind of cut your costs according to the amounts of funds that you will get, uh, we gradually had to kind of narrow down the particular amount of uh, building that we would do in the basement. So it's got slightly smaller than that, but broadly speaking, it's given us what we need. Uh, and then came this, which was that here we were, we sort of had long chats with Wandsworth Council, which is our local borough, uh, well before planning. And they were very concerned that there is this particular uh, frontage in that part of uh, South London, uh, which sees evidence of the Dutch migrants who had been uh, in Wandsworth a long time ago, and so there's sort of remnants of dark architecture styles of the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, and of course the very kind of Edwardian styles. And they were very concerned that we do not rip those apart because they imagined that what we were going to do was just efface the whole thing and you know, build a steel and glass block. So we had long discussions with them saying, no, we love the frontage as much as you do. We are exploring ways in which we try and retain that frontage and yet have the kind of extension of services that, that we need uh, for the building. So Julian came up with this idea that you, you have the keep the existing frontage, 
but then you insert a cube almost as if you put it just behind the frontage. Uh, and then there was all these sort of thoughts and these are the initial ideas, well, what would that cube look like? And that's really when we thought more and more about Earth and started thinking about rendering, uh, about, you know, I had this crazy idea, why don't we build it out of mud? Yeah, fine, but you know, maybe there's something equivalent to, to mud. So it got into rendering, it got into pargeting, all those sorts of discussions. Um, and this was his initial sketch uh, of how it might look. The sketch evolves as we go on. These were the kind of various things that we were drawing upon. Uh, the idea of screens out of India where the, the, there's this sort of real play with light. Um, uh, yeah, let's just move on. And then finally, uh, I think we cracked it, is when we started to talk of rather than some sort of convoluted shape outside, let it be a tree. And it sort of dawned on us on the day when it was apparent that we we're going to have to cut down the tree which was holding up the patio area. Uh, and how would we replace it? Uh, so there were sort of two things. One was that we would actually create this whole bank um, once I got sl uh, sleepers uh, donated by Network Rail. We'd create a fence of sleepers and then we would cover that with uh, jasmine vines. So the whole thing would become a little kind of bower. But that we put the tree or we do a kind of rendered version of that tree on the facade. Um, which is then eventually what it sort of comes to. And so that sort of, I mean, these were his, the, the designs he'd sort of submitted. That's not the color scheme. We went through millions of sort of color schemes, but broadly speaking, that, that idea. And we found a company in Germany, uh, I think Sodoko, uh, who have this particular kind of rendering technique. Um, uh, and we're able to also create the reliefs that we needed and to mold those reliefs very carefully. Uh, and so they'd sort of come on board for this project. Uh, these are just all sort of different uh, thingies. That's, you know, again, these were all these lovely impressions we were giving to, to planning about what it looked like. Then we got into the serious bit of the construction, which there are just some of these sort of things in here which give you some idea. And there's a photograph. There is the beginning of the earth floor. Now, the earth is from Devon, the only county in England, as far as I'm aware, only county in British Isles, which has this Jurassic, slightly reddish soil. And I was absolutely adamant that's the color we need in this space. And we found this wonderful craftsman, Kevin McCabe, uh, who for years has been building walls and floors all out of earth, Devon earth, uh, with a mixture of cob and straw. And he loved the idea, and so you know, I never, I've never done it in the, for, a, for a theater stage, but you know, hey, why not, let's give it a go. Uh, and so he came, and that, that was one of the sort of final acts of construction, was, was him uh, laying the, the, the floor down, which takes six hours uh, to actually Lay, lay out once you've got the mix together, and then takes two weeks to um, dry up. And the only addition we put on that one um, was that we used another very traditional uh, item of uh, English culture, which was linseed oil to seal the floor. Uh, and the great property of linseed oil, provided you mix it with organic turpentine, is that it doesn't mess up the color. So the color remains the same, but it fixes the soil so you don't get the dust. <coughs> so it's fantastic. Um, this uh, is the next sort of stage within the thinking, which was that part of what makes a building is, of course, this very um, um, indefinable thing of character, uh, feel. Um, and we know it from our houses, you know, you move into your home, whether it's a new home or a, an old house. It takes a while for it to take on your, your character. 
and we thought a lot about this that you know, inevitably there is going to be a certain newness to this building. How do we, how do we retain the sense that it is an old as much as a new? Yes, we've got the facade, but what else? And it was a day when um, uh, uh, Julian with, the, uh, with my project manager we were discussing the doors. And as soon as I saw the door, I, I, I thought, no way. Uh, so, and, and fortunately, Claudia agreed with me, and so did Julian uh, Middleton. Uh, and we said, well, what do we do? Doors from India, old doors. And uh, Claudia knew where to go to, and so I arranged for the architect and for Claudia to go off to Jodhpur and find the doors. Uh, and that's what we did. So uh, these are the doors. Uh, and literally, each of the doors, uh, we, we know its provenance, we know where it's from. We know also that it is at least 100 years old, and it is all teak wood. So when it came to fire regulations and so forth, well, actually, it was a doddle, uh, because these are really, really sturdy teak wood doors. Uh, and they spent three days, because by then they knew exactly where the doors need to go, all those sorts of things, uh, and found these kinds of various doors which adorn different parts of the building, uh, along with all sorts of other stuff which is still hanging around. And let's just go on to the next one. So this is, this is what it currently looks like. Uh, and this was on the ultimate that um, just uh, a, a kind of a month before handover, the whole question became, all right, now with that rendered frontage, Julian had this color scheme of red and then after having been to Jodhpur, he decided blue, I was very excited by blue. And we said, no, forget all of that really. Let it age, so let, let us keep the render the base color that it is, which is a kind of brick, uh, sandy brick color. Let us live with it. Let us see how uh, that ages with the rest of the block. And then we'll think about whether, in fact, we want to kind of repaint it. Yeah, so that just uh, gives you some other sort of sense. So basically, uh, all along the building, so all along basically, so that's the that's the street. Uh, so all along, right up to the top, uh, there are wraparound windows. So we, we can all look out and people can look in, uh, in every sort of corner around every sort of tree branch, bar, of course, in the basement, which is not possible. However, I do advise everyone, should you ever visit the theater, and I would love to welcome you all there, Please go to the loos. <laughs> That's all I'll say. <laughs> um, uh, so that gives you kind of. So this is this is in the basement. So on the left is the actors' uh, changing room. Uh, there's a door, the green door that we saw, which block which blocks access from from uh, for the public, uh, and uh, then yes, those uh, skip through those ones. Yes. Uh, this is the entrance to the foyer, uh, and, that door, and then that's the theater in there. Every one of those bricks is the old building, 7,500 of them. Uh, every single one of them was stored uh, to be put back into the theater. And in the theater, what we wanted was, apart from getting a height, much greater height, which is now 5.6 meters, uh, was to have daylight come through. Uh, and to shut that daylight off uh, were these shutters that uh, Julian and Claudia found in India, uh, uh, which were in fact ceiling panels, but we've turned them into shutters, which are used, uh, you know, operated by very simple low technology, which is a person with a rope pulling it along. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And now, and again, this was not a, we couldn't have known this beforehand, what we found is that every time when we had an event, and we did a variety of sort of uh, uh, soft openings, uh, I would just shut the, the shutter. And it acted exactly like the house lights coming down. So now it's become a rule within the theater. 
forget about house lights, just close the shutter and everyone knows, right, something's going to begin. That's as simple as, as that. Uh, the theater has got, it was expanded by 50%, so it's now got uh, 100 seats. Uh, and the seats, uh, all these fixed seats, I'd found in a dump. The RSC had dumped these seats from its courtyard theater. And they were marvelous because they are the only seats that I could see which are actually narrow but beautifully comfortable. And they had the right color. They were red. I hadn't asked for it. Uh, and they had wood backing, so really perfect. Uh, so I sort of said to, to this particular kind of warehouse person, look, I'll buy that particular stock. Uh, but we didn't have enough of those seats, so we got that uh, uh, particular warehouse to build bench seating for us on a similar kind of style. And with that bench seating, the idea should be, and what we've created is that the seat lifts up so that you've got a storage space in there. Uh, very essential people come during the winter and so on and so forth. So these are just some sort of thing. These pink bicycles... Uh, were actually got from Jodhpur, because at the time there was this whole campaign going on uh, in uh, Jodhpur, uh, not only about the sort of pink revolution in terms of uh, the, the uh, whole female eman emancipation movement in India, uh, but also in terms of uh, getting people away from their cars. So, well, well that's great, so we've got two of those bicycles in. Uh, to put in, the, in our patio for use by whoever. I mean, it could be staff, it could be visitors, uh, just to kind of move around in. Uh, and that's the, the uh, upstairs, uh, and then that's the kind of rehearsal room, uh, which again has the door. And then we had uh, all the roofs are sedum roofs. Uh, and on the sedum roofs, then, we placed a total of 16 solar panels. Uh, so they cover this roof and the roof right at the top. Uh, and yeah, that just gives you a kind of view right from the top. Oh, that's fine. And that's just the kind of staircase. All those extraordinary things. Anyway, so I think that gives us a kind of sense of what this, this space is. Um, the 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 theatre was reopened, uh, appropriately enough, by uh, Sadiq Khan, who was now the mayor of London. And appropriately enough, I got him to uh, stamp his hand on parchment um, using ink made from the soil, uh, Kevin McCabe's ink. Uh, and so his handprint now adorns the, the theatre. And the fact that it had to be on parchment so that it would remain as someone said to me, the person who made the parchment, well, it'll last for 400 years, so you know, if you're happy with that, that'll do. Okay, great. Uh, and so far, it has lasted extremely well. Um, yeah, I don't know how much time I've got, but just in five minutes, I'll just run through some of the other things. What was really important with this uh, project was that, uh, uh, A, I had a very, very good project manager, uh, Nick Cragg of Cragg Management. And one of the things that he guided me into was, look, when it comes to construction, there will be two forms of procurement. Usually for the theaters, it's a traditional procurement. You know, you've got the design, you give it over to the contractors, and then that's that. Much greater risk for you uh, on that one. Or it could be a design and build. Uh, and in the design and build, the contractor will take on some of the risks. So it's a little bit more insurance. The problem was that we had gone quite far in working out our designs. What real input is the contractor going to make? However, we did find a firm who became our principal contractors, H.A. Marks. And they were fabulous because they really bought into the project. And were prepared to kind of add their own comments in terms of adjusting some of the things that would need to be done in here, and so accepted the design and build process, which was very, very useful for us. And it certainly meant that our risk element was, was cut down considerably. Uh, obviously, the project did go over, but not that much. And in fact, we were able to work very, very well uh, with the principal contractors uh, to make sure that actually we're not going to get stung with 
additional kind of costs. The other thing was that it became really, really important. Now, this could be because, and of course it is, a large part of it is because this is a relatively small project. Total cost of it was 2.7 million. The Arts Council capital grants gave us about 70%, and we had to raise the other 30%. Uh, one of the best supporters, apart from 1,400-odd individuals, um, were landfill charities. And landfill charities have, uh, are very keen on uh, sustainability. They define it slightly differently, but are very keen if a project has that dimension built into it. Uh, and this particular charity uh, war, that we found who ended up supporting us were very positive about the program that we had on board. And so they supported a lot of our uh, ASOS uh, pumps, our lift, uh, our um, CDEM roofs, all those elements within the building itself. The other thing was that in all of this thinking, sorry. Sure, so, so just one final thing I would say is uh, what are the three things? Well, vision, I think, terribly important. What is the vision of this space? The energy, it's bloody, bloody bone-rakingly difficult, this, as I'm sure <laughs> Stephanie will concur. And it, there are numerous times, there are more times when you'll think of giving up than there are of continuing on. So the energy is really important. And I'd end up by saying, don't take no for an answer. Really important. Sorry, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't think this works. Ah, it, it does, actually. Um, thank you so much. I'm sorry that I asked you to wrap up. It was super interesting, but I'm sure that, that you know, that there, are some, there are some questions, and I, I was aware of time. Um, so, is, yeah, anyone in the room? who might want to ask anything to Jatinda or Stephanie? Lauren? Thank you, just a very boring, very practical question for Stephanie. I was just wondering in terms of the initial feasibility study and audit process, um, did you do, was that an internal process or did you appoint somebody external and did you budget for that or did you need to fundraise for that or, you know? Um, the, Thank you. The initial, um, we had it done externally, um, it was really important that we had something that would stand up. So we didn't yet know whether it was going to work <clears throat> or um, what the impact was going to be, but we took a flutter, basically. I think the initial feasibility cost something like 1,500 quid, which we didn't particularly have, yeah. Yeah. but we did that anyway. And um, it, it, what that did was it paved the way for more detailed work, which cost more. But to get the orig original snapshot was a combination of working with Nottingham Trent University and working with Focus, I think they were called. Um, and it was really worth doing because it gave you something that wasn't just you saying, I bet this will work. Um, so it was, it was money well spent, yeah. Thank you, that's helpful. Any other questions? This. Yeah. Just that. Sorry, I've already asked a question today. Um, but both of those case studies are really fascinating. Um, in particular about Tara, though, it, there seems to be quite a few decisions which were fortuitous. It was fortuitous that you got those seats uh, for your theatre. It was fortuitous that there was that plot of land uh, next door. Um, how do you um, remain flexible enough to your vision to allow to accommodate these um, bonuses which kind of just sort of uh, crop up on you? Um, yeah, but you sort of keep pursuing the idea uh, uh, because I'd already been thinking that, okay, I, I, I'm not sure I can get these seats. This is well before the RSC example. And so we were thinking of uh, uh, getting seats from eBay, uh, so getting kind of different types of seats. So the idea was just slightly, still keeping the sense of kind of home. Uh, which we would then either paint or we would dress with a particular kind of color. So that, that was sort of part of the kind of thing. So there, there's always, I suppose it's this thing of, oh, the best thing really is this Buddhist quote, hold on to your certainties with a vengeance. 
let go of them lightly. I love that paradox. I really love that paradox. <laughs> and for me, that was a real sort of driving thing. In terms of that plot of land, we had our eyes on it, uh, uh, but actually that proved to be quite interesting because the original feasibility that Steve Tompkins did, he used that plot of land as a service thing. So this was where all the staircases and lifts and all that would go in through that plot of land. As soon as uh, Network Rail blocked it by saying, look, we are not going to give you this land, it became a thing of, well, how else could we use it? Uh, and this was where, again, that thinking that we want it in some way to be green. And that's where the idea came, well, actually, we'll turn this into a garden, so forget about a structure. If that's what's holding it up, we will not have a structure. We will not have a permanent structure. And that meant the thing that went through. Sorry, I didn't know. Sorry. Yeah. Can you please actually say your name as well in organization? Yes, hello. Um, I'm Francine, and I'm the co-artistic director of Blooming Ludus, a brand new theater company. Uh, we make participatory work f uh, around environmental issues. And listening to these two organizations that have quite a lot of clout and support behind them, it's lovely to see. How do your theater goers respond to the efforts that you've made? How do they respond to these amazing spaces? Um, I don't think most of them notice, to be honest. Um, I think they're happy that we can still afford to function in an environment of reducing subsidy. I think it probably makes them have a slightly warm feeling when they come and they see our energy usage is so low on our front of house screens and obviously we have our environmental statement. It, it, Nottingham Plains, because it's a 1960s building and it's concrete and it's glass, it doesn't have an earth floor, it doesn't have that. It's not, you know, it's, it's an era that was very much about man-made, man-made, you know, not natural. So I think in an organisation like ours, it's a little bit harder to communicate than maybe it is in your wonderful, uh, converted, adapted, reborn space. Um, I think anyone likes to deal with a company that they feel is ethically sound. Anyone and everyone does. But how much they really care about it, I'm not convinced. But they're glad that we're still there. So that's good. That already says quite a bit. <laughs> no, I'd, I'd agree with that. I mean, I think uh, certainly our, our, the, the sort of 1,400-odd individuals absolutely care. I mean, each time they come in, they can see the solar panels. They can see how much energy is happening. So, you know, they're very kind of proud of it. Um, but by and large, for most people, it is, it is a lovely space, and that so far, I haven't heard anyone say it is not, uh, and they are comfortable, and they can hear properly, and I think that's really what they are concerned about. And so in a way, their commitment to sustainability comes uh, via the fact that they are very committed for, for this theatre to carry on. Mm -hmm. And ultimately for us, all of us, I think that's the important thing, that we know we have both local and extra local audiences which feel that this is an important theatre. Are there any more questions? We have time maybe for one very quick one. Just over here. I don't know if... Lauren? Uh, yeah. uh, hello, I'm uh, Alex Solo from uh, the Free Word Centre. Uh, we're a literature and free expression uh, arts venue and uh, home for six charities in London. And I just wanted to ask, uh, Jatinda, you seem to um, use quite a lot of reclaimed materials in your build. And I just wondered if you could tell me a bit more about what were the advantages um, or, or the problems with, with like, sourcing and using your reclaimed materials. That's really <laughs> interesting. Yes, the one adv advantage, if one can call it an advantage, um, uh, I had a screen painter in uh, fairly early on, and he kept on sniffing in the theatre. So after a while, I got fed up and said, Jamie, what are you sniffing? He said, you've used reclaimed bricks, haven't you? I said, yeah, well, it's, you know, you can see it, right? He said, I knew it. Because reclaimed bricks give a whiff. <laughs> and it is the whiff of the years of people sweat and breathing and all that. It retains it. Whereas new brick will not have that kind of whiff. Oh, well, that's brilliant. I love that idea. I love the idea that there is, this, there is a kind of history to this building already, even though it's kind of uh, remade. And I would say that, I mean, I don't know what the um, technical advantages are in terms of energy use and so forth. 
But that feel that this is personal, this is human, uh, is something that one just will not get from a machine tooled uh, piece. You, you, you won't. Uh, and that's absolutely invaluable. Uh, particularly, I think, for, for theatres, because theatres are about people. Uh, it, it, it's us sharing stories together. And that's where it's so important that, those, that there are some materials which have this sort of feel of, of a history. Uh, and it's exactly the same thing as with those Indian doors. By the fact that they are old but also beautiful, they've had so many touches, and that's exactly what we wanted. Everyone touches them, yeah, either because they're just fascinated by them or just because you know, they can't believe that you know, there is this door. Uh, where does it sort of come from? Uh, and of course, it has this wonderful thing that on the reverse, uh, it hasn't been cleaned off. If you have any idea of Indian workmanship, it is all about the facade. It's not at the back. It's exactly like in the theater. It's all manky at the back. So you look at the reverse of the door, and these nails have gone through, and they have been hammered down. So you can see that it is an individual's work, which has just hammered these nails down. They haven't sort of cut it or smoothed it off. And that's what people respond to, it seems to me. Well, I don't think, unfortunately, we have time for any more questions. But thank you very much, Stephanie and Jatinder. Very interesting. And obviously, they will be around here. We have a coffee break now at 3. I think it's for 20 minutes. or um, So I'm sure you, you'll be able to grab them for more questions if you have any. If you're planning to leave earlier, please do fill in the forms that we have outside in the sort of reception area. And, and I think that's, that's all. Thank you very much.
Is the... Uh, it is. Hi, everybody. I'm Claire from Julie's Bicycle. Um, you're very welcome to this next session, which is about the people and systems element of developing sustainable buildings. Um, please don't be afraid to move up and come and sit up a bit further. It feels a bit like um, a very scattered audience, so please, please, please come up. There's lots of interesting stuff to hear. Um, <laughs> This session is being live streamed, so um, we will all be speaking into the mics, and when you have Q&As afterwards, if you could please um, speak into the mic and say your name and organization to make sure that we get that on the live stream as well. Um, uh, again, housekeeping, there's no fire alarm test planned, so if it does go off, please do follow the evacuation signs. And if you are tweeting, um, uh, at Julie's Bicycle is our Twitter um, handle, and hashtag Coptimism is our lovely hashtag. Um, so the topic for now is about people and systems. I think we've heard a fair bit this morning about building, building materials, building fabric, building technology. And what we've also heard time and again is how absolutely crucial it is to involve the people in the building, who is managing it, who is using it, who is coming and visiting it and enjoying your cultural space. Um, so we have um, some fantastic examples in the Fit for the Future guide, which we developed on behalf of Arts Council England, which gives some examples already of different approaches to involving people to thinking about the systems and training and engaging building users. Um, some of the examples we have are Space um, Artist Studios, which is based in London, which refurbished their building and did fantastic work with um, the artists actually using the studios. Uh, we have a great case study from the Whitworth in Manchester and how they really engaged with their gallery teams in redeveloping the building and they do a huge amount of work with staff and engaging their schools and communities coming in on sustainability. And another fantastic example in the Fit for the Future guide is the Chichester Festival Theatre which had a very extensive um, heritage engagement program for developing its site and also based in a parkland has had extensive um, engagement with um, local nature organizations and um, biodiversity plants and, and charities. So there's some of the examples in the Fit for the Future guide from which this event has, has come. Um, but now we have two um, speakers who are going to share their experiences within their organizations. We have Robert Longthorne, who's building development director at the Everyman um, Liverpool Every Man and the Playhouse. Robert oversaw the design and construction of the new Every Man, which opened in 2014 to great acclaim and to great success and has won the Sterling Prize in 2014 and has also won Sibsi Building Performance Awards. So it's a building that has been designed and has had sustainability integrated throughout. Um, and we're going to hear more from Robert about the people and the systems elements beyond the actual investments. And Lizzie is head of technical resources at Mac Birmingham. She has a background in technical theater and she has previously worked at the Liverpool Playhouse. Um, I'm assuming you guys know each other. <laughs> um, at the West Yorkshire Playhouse and at the Lowry. She has a keen interest in sustainability and is an active member of, the Mac, of Mac Birmingham's green team. As head of technical resources, she's um, responsible for facilities management and developing and taking practical action to make sure that the environmental action and aims of Mac Birmingham align to the broader needs of the building um, and what it's for. So we're gonna have a 15, 20 minute presentation from each person, and we are going to start with Robert. Right, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to, for the person who's trying to um, 
keep up with what I'm doing here. I'm going to cut a lot of the guff at the beginning um, to get, try and leave some time for questions at the end. Um, but what I would like to um, uh, do is start off by just very briefly telling you a little bit about our organisation. Um, we are not just the everyman, that's the one that gets all the publicity at the moment. We uh, run two theatres, the Playhouse in the centre of uh, Liverpool uh, and uh, the everyman. The Playhouse on the left there is a uh, Victorian musical um, built in 1866. Um, altered in 1896, extended for the Rep Theatre that took it over in 1911 um, and uh, had an extension, modern extension built in uh, uh, 1966 to 68. Um, not, a, not a very uh, green building in a lot of ways you might think. Um, uh, our other building, the Everyman, um, was, uh, as already been said, was opened in 2014, uh, three years ago tomorrow. Um, so uh, that's a, a somewhat different uh, prospect to the Playhouse. Um, I should say the trust that runs both the theatres um, owns the Everyman Freehold. We don't own the Playhouse, it's uh, owned by the City Council and we've got it on a long, full repairing lease. Um, in the briefing notes um, uh, for these sessions, uh, Julie's Bicycle um, asked the speakers to be as honest as possible. So um, in that spirit, I'm going to say we are not um, the experts uh, when it comes to energy efficiency and all that sort of thing, um, but we've done a bit along the way. Um, in fact, really as an organisation, I have to say we are probably a little bit behind the curve. Um, we've had a kind of busy decade, really, um, since we uh, kind of started the process of rebuilding the Everyman. Um, we've also... Um, in the last 10 years, um, rethought how we work as a company completely. Um, we've, re, you know, obviously we've built the Everyman, uh, we've kept uh, the other the playhouse going. It uh, needs quite a lot of uh, tender loving care to, to keep it going. Um, we've maintained all our other activities, so the activities we do out in the community um, with Young Everyman Playhouse, which is our sort of youth theatre wing, um, and all the myriad other things we do against a, a backdrop of falling um, grants and uh, trying to find new sources of income. But you've all heard it before, you've all been there, you know exactly how it is. But it does mean that we've actually been taking a bit of a softly, softly approach, um, particularly with the, with the staff um, on um, environmental matters. Um, Looking at the challenge that we face, um, trying to be as environmental um, as possible, um, that's um, one of our big issues. This building um, with the 1968 extension um, effectively leaked energy. Um, in 2000, we got an opportunity to do some work on it because we had to actually um, get the theatre licence back. It had been lost when the Playhouse went bust. So the first job the Trust um, had was to, to get the Playhouse reopened. And we were able to do some work on uh, bringing, up the, bringing the Playhouse up to more modern standards. On the other hand, we've got the Everyman, which is a purpose-designed, sustainable new building. Um, and that's where one of our issues kind of really begins. Um, we've obviously got staff working across the two sites. Um, and you can work in slightly different ways in the, in, in the two buildings. Um, at the Everyman, a lot of the time, you don't have to think about light switches. Um, the lights come on and they will switch off automatically when you leave the space. The problem is people get used to that at the Everyman, go down to the playhouse and leave the lights on. So one of the things we've had to do is uh, actually make our maintenance team a little more proactive in going around and switching things off. Um, but we also do quite a bit of work of, of kind of softly following that up um, as well. So we did a bit of work in 2000 um, to, to the Playhouse. Um, there's a huge um, additional amount of work to be done. Things that we've done along the way have tended to be against the background that we think there's going to be a capital project coming just around the corner. Um, so we're always hedging our bets. Um, when we started the project, for the Everyman and actually started off as a project for both theatres um, and uh, it only became a project just to do the Everyman. Um, we've always had this idea that the Playhouse is going to follow on. Um, so we're always doing that thing of trying not to spend money that is going to be wasted in the future. 
Um, inevitably, the way these things drag on, we could have spent a lot of money that wouldn't have been wasted because it would have paid for itself by now, but hey. Things we have tended to do have been those, those kind of soft, easy things. Um, so we've had a rolling program of replacing tungsten halogen lamps um, with LEDs. Uh, we chose to do that by basically doing it as tungsten halogen lamps failed and we ran out of stock, we then actually started replacing with LEDs. And it meant in the early days what we were doing, we trialled lots of LEDs. I can talk for hours about tatty LEDs from China and things that really don't do the job. Um, but that was a way we could do that, paying for that just out of our normal R&R budgets. It was easy to do, and the whole time, every time you replaced, uh, put a, an LED in, you knew you were saving money. So the economic argument was, was an easy one to make constantly. Um, that did drag on for quite a long time, that, uh, that initiative, and in fact, um, for Christmas uh, just gone, we finally did the final replacement of everything. Uh, front of house of the playhouse. So we now have the entire front of house is completely lit, apart from a few um, 2D fittings, um, is completely lit by, by LEDs. Um, and a great improvement in light quality, great improvement in the warmth of the space in terms of looks, um, but also it's actually saving us money. Um, something else that we did in 2014, we replaced the boilers. Um, they were 30 years old. Uh, we'd butchered one of the five units for spare parts because you can't buy spare parts anymore. And it actually got to the stage where we had to do something serious with it. Um, fortunately, ACE um, allowed us to fund that out of our capital funding for the buildings. Um, they recognised that um, there was no point in rebuilding the Everyman if the company kind of couldn't function in the meanwhile. Um, and keeping the playhouse going was, was one of the things that we were allowed to spend some money on. Um, and that was a very useful um, thing to us. It was great, great that the Arts Council agreed um, that we could be looking at what the whole company was doing, not just that capital project um, for the everyman. Um, we put in uh, new um, efficient condensing boilers um, and they've made a huge difference. We can now actually heat the building, um, which we used to struggle to do, um, so they are much more efficient. We've actually reduced gas consumption at the same time and that's all evidenced by our display energy certificates. Um, we first did a display energy certificate for the Playhouse in 2013. We scored 39. Um, I had to be picked up off the floor. Um, because I was stunned that we'd managed to get that low. Um, it's not a bad score for an 1866 slash uh, 1896 slash 1911 slash 1966 building. Um, and the boiler change certainly actually um, accounted for some of the drop that we've managed to make. We've maintained um, the B rating, which is what a 39 gives you, um, but we've actually now reduced the score to 32. Um, so the boiler was part of that. Um, we also think changing to LED um, and that kind of softer approach of training staff to switch things off um, has also helped. But actually probably when you look at the, sorry, the figures from year to year, the biggest change was that actually came in 2014 when all the office function for the organisation that was based in the Playhouse moved up into the new Everyman. Um, and you can see an interesting drop at that point um, so quite interesting how much energy an office function takes up. Um, the new Everyman has proven to be extremely energy efficient. Um, data from the City Building Performance Awards um, is the thing that really backs that up. Um, we've heard a bit about um, kilowatts per square metre and uh, the problems of using these metrics. Um, but just to kind of highlight where we are, um, the building is... Um, basically consuming the rate of about 220 kilowatts, um, kilowatt hours per square metre per year. Um, the design uh, was 20% above that um, at uh, 275 kilowatt hours um, per square metre per year. Um, and that is actually um, ooh, way under, less than half of the appropriate SIPSI benchmark for a building of this type, the TM46 benchmark. Um, which actually says it should be 570 um, kilowatt hours per metre per year. Um, interestingly, um, although we haven't done a full um, 
uh, TM46 type analysis of the playhouse, uh, the decks give you an idea of energy consumption per square metre and we're actually coming in pretty much on that benchmark for that very old building. Um, so there must be something that we're doing right. Um, so the difference in the two buildings uh, and the way that they work um, does mean that for um, energy, efficient, in energy efficiency terms, environmental terms, we do really have to think about the two buildings individually. Um, so we are constantly looking at ways we can improve um, both the buildings. Um, we've got a, some works planned for the summer which will look particularly at the, the external envelope of the building and see what we can do there, uh, improving uh, glazing. So obviously a lot of it's um, uh, playhouses, it's grade two star listed, so we have limitations in what we can do because of the listing. So we are looking at secondary glazing where we can't do double glazing. Uh, we're looking at improving uh, the doors um, so we don't have so many air leaks and things like that. So lots of bits and pieces. Um, and that work we're hoping is going to be paid for um, with a loan from the City Council. Um, the capital loan is effectively paid, um, paid for by reducing our grant. Um, and the way the councils are now doing this, um, and I think this is becoming quite common, is that to look at ways of reducing revenue, they will give you capital money. Um, but the, basically you're going to lose that revenue money for the rest of the period that you have the building. In our case, that's the, till the end of the lease. Um, it was a 125-year lease starting in 2000. So we've got a bit of time to pay off um, what we're doing there. And it's actually a very, very easy way of funding um, uh, works on up to a certain uh, scale. Um, we'll look at ways we can reduce lighting load as well. We're going to look at um, extending what we've done uh, front of house to back of house, where at the moment we're extensively on fluorescent fittings and a few discharge fittings and things. We know we can drop energy consumption enormously um, by both um, putting in LEDs but also putting in much better controls. So actually getting those presence and absence detection systems that we have in the everyman down in the playhouse, that's going to be um, financed and we hope actually using the manufacturer's financing scheme where, again, they guarantee you'll save so much um, over the life of that equipment and that will pay, uh, pay off the loan um, that effectively you get for, to buy that equipment in the first place. Looking at the, um, uh, back to the, the everyman, um, there, we have a number of systems in there, a lot of technology, new technology in there, certainly new technology to us. Um, one of the systems we have that is really falling short of what we expected to do is a rainwater harvesting system. Rainwater harvesting sounds simple. Take the water off the roof, throw it through a filter, store it, and then pump it around the building to flush toilets, in our case. Um, system was designed um, by the services engineers to effectively break even, at, um, giving us 45% of the toilet water consumption. Um, unfortunately, we certainly for the first year or so, we were barely managing to do 14%. Um, so what we actually have is some very expensive water um, that is coming free from the sky. And then by the time we've treated it and paid for um, maintenance on a system that seems to have an enormous number of problems, um, it's working out a very expensive um, uh, system to use. We've not even bothered looking at whether there's any carbon saving in doing this. Um, it's, we've just spent all our time just trying to get our system working better. Um, pleased to say that that kind of the long term um, does, does pay off. So here we are, so three years in, um, we're actually finally having made some tweaks to the way we're collecting water and things. Um, we've got a bit more work to do on the way the filtration works and we're hoping then we're going to start to collect enough water off the roof that it will actually start to meet its, its design levels. So say we, we've taken a fairly low-key approach um, uh, with staff. Um, we use the capital project to actually start really talking about um, what we were going to try and achieve uh, for sustainability and actually try to do a lot of little things um, to, to in, encourage staff to think green. Um, one of the um, initiatives we used was uh, green tea and pea, um, meaning green the Everman and Playhouse. Um, and this was done, we're 
we've done energy audits, um, which were very interesting, two different energy audits by completely different bodies. Um, both of them cherry-picked the easy wins and completely avoided the thing that we really wanted to talk about, which was a holistic way of looking at how we improve our environmental uh, credentials over a period of time. They basically, neither of them wanted to go there. Um, so what we did do is we cherry-picked their ideas and used a lot of the, the, the simple things to try and get things going. Uh, Green TMP was a way of uh, trying to introduce to, to staff thinking about the way that we, um, we use energy as individuals. Um, so the little labels that go by light switches just reminding people of if they switch off, um, they're saving um, CO2, they're saving money. Um, and that money, obviously, we then kind of emphasise that can be ploughed back into um, the work that we're doing and, and other things, maybe even their pay packets. Um, once the capital project got underway, um, apart from reporting on progress of the project, um, I was constantly highlighting um, the green aspects of the building um, to try and, again, kind of softly, softly um, remind people um, of where we were trying to go as an organisation. Um, it was a fairly frenetic period, particularly leading up to the opening of the, of the new Everyman, and it took us uh, over a year, well over a year, um, to be able to do the, the next thing that we really wanted to do, which was to do a, a full staff environmental awareness day, um, which we ran with the, with the help of Julie's Bicycle. Um, we wanted to avoid preaching of people, um, so trying to find a sort of creative uh, um, way of, of expressing what we were going to do and try and make people um, curious about it. Um, we actually called the day uh, a future built on trifles, uh, not the jelly and custard type. Um, this is taken from a, a, a quote from Mahatma Gandhi um, uh, about all big things being made up of trifles. My entire life has been built on trifles. It seemed a good way of introducing the notion um, that we're each capable of small change. And all that small change actually really does add up. And that's kind of the way that we've been emphasising um, with the staff what we're doing. Um, we used the recap of, um, of the environmental credentials of the, of the Everyman as a springboard uh, on that day. Um, and uh, we introduced the Environmental Policy and Action Plan, which a lot of people, I'm quite sure, had never bothered to uh, find on the server and read. Um, and we started to throw in the notion of actually really getting a green team together and working together. Um, the way that we gathered ideas and kind of got people involved on that, door, uh, on that day was using uh, something I'm sure all of you will have come across, um, the Ideas Cafe, um, where you have sessions um, around the table, small groups, you consider a, a question and then you move on to another question. Um, it was something we were very familiar with. We've done a lot of it um, in, the pro in the process of planning for a new building. Um, we did a Horizons exercise as well. And the other thing we tried to do is make sure that all those questions were overlapping to a certain extent. So themes developed through the days, ideas got, devel ideas got developed through the day. So questions like, um, what can we do that will minimise travel? Um, how can we communicate with our audiences about our sustainability aims and actions? Um, how can we reduce environmental impact of the audience and company travel? Um, what small changes can be made to reduce energy and water use? So all quite simple questions overlapping, but actually you get a wealth of information back from it. Um, for instance, one of the things that we did was, was brought up during the day was, was COP21, um, and which triggered an idea in one of our um, staff members um, about it takes 21 days to break a habit. Uh, and one of the things that they came up with on their table in the Ideas Cafe um, was 21 ideas um, to make the company greener. Um, so we ended up with a lot of small change ideas and the great thing was that people were quite enthused by the day and went away and started to put a lot of those things into action. Um, one of the wonderful things that happened um, uh, was our Young Everyman Playhouse decided to make their next production um, carbon neutral. Um, this was a show called The Environmentalists. Um, it was verified using industry green tools, so it was very interesting. I was able to introduce that to Young Everyman Playhouse, um, which is effectively a complete mirror organisation. We have young actors, young technicians, young producers, uh, young writers and so on. So it really is a mirror of the adult organisation. They work with us constantly 
Um, and what we're trying to do is, is provide them with experience and basic training so they can go on to work in the industry, go on to further training or whatever. Um, they had already decided they wanted to do um, a play based around um, environmental issues. Um, so it was quite easy for men to start to pick up on some of the ideas that had come out of our awareness day. Um, and there were lots lots of things. There, there is actually um, a blog on the uh, Julie's Bicycle website, which you can see a bit more of the detail. Um, but amongst the things that they did for that was to reduce um, carbon footprint of audience travel, was we ran walking buses from key points. Um, uh, we gave the audience um, seedlings to take away um, to grow. Um, the idea being to remind the, the audience of the production and the, the values that have been talked about in that production um, and not giving them leaflets and hard information trying to preach to them. Um, and we asked them to tweet back pictures of their plants as they grew, which was great because actually what we found was even months on, people were still engaged um, with, with the um, project. Our wardrobe supervisor is, is another one of the people who just kind of picked up on the idea and gone off and researched um, how she can improve um, uh, the, um, on the chemicals and things that, that her department normally uses. And so she announced in, the, in our weekly newsletter uh, last week that we've now switched over to using eco balls, um, uh, search for it on the internet, um, uh, instead of uh, normal laundry detergents as a way of, of improving our green credentials. So lots of little things um, that, um, that will encourage people. Um, something else. Yep, I'm very nearly there. Uh, we have beehives on the roof. Um, they are really our bees flying about there. Some showing off with their iPhone. Um, we've, beehives are one of our strategies we had for improving the ecology on the site to get our Briam points. Um, we also have bat boxes. Our wonderful builders, um, one of the... Uh, one of the people, directors close involved with the project, uh, is a Twitcher and suggested we put Swift boxes in, and they actually said, it's OK, we'll pay for those. So we have the Swift boxes as well. We're hoping that this year, three years in, we actually might start to see um, Swifts using those boxes for the first time because we will have gone through the cycle we need to uh, for nesting sites. Um, what's come out of the bees is we trained a number of volunteer staff up to be uh, to the basic levels of beekeeping. I have a certificate to prove I know how to do it. Um, as do they. Um, but what it has done is actually start to raise their awareness. So we now have a group of people within the organisation who are very committed to looking after those bees, are very interested in all the chemicals that are sprayed to the point where a pair of them actually went and challenged a council workman when he was spraying weeds around the building, saying, do you realise what you're doing by doing that? Um, so subtly in the background, these things that we've been doing have been encouraging the staff. Um, I'm going to leave with, we were asked to, for three um, key pieces of advice. I'll get there eventually. There we go. Um, small and often is an effective way of engaging staff, and making it fun really does help. Complex and expensive technological solutions should always be the last result. And communicate your, uh, your achievements and your failures. We all learn as much from failures as we do from the things that work. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Lizzie Moran. I'm Head of Technical Resources from at Birmingham. As, uh, Introduction said, I've, my background's in technical theatre, I'm a technician, so I'm not used to speaking in front of people that often, so please bear with me. Um, so we'll, I'll start with introducing Mac, so here's a lovely picture of Mac in the summer. Um, the original building was built in 1962. Um, this incarnation, uh, there was a major refurb in 2008-9, and it reopened to the public in May 2010. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the refurb because I started in March 2010. I wasn't really involved in any of that. Um, if you're interested, Michelle, who did the introduction here, would be the person to talk to because she was the person who, one of the people who lived through it, as it were. Um, so the old building, as I understand it, was 
very highly unsustainable in many ways. Um, and so the refurb really helped with sustainability just by stuff like fixing the roof, insulation, replacing boilers, replacing plants, that sort of thing. So that refurb inevitably helped sustainability because it, you know, it, it was actually mending the existing building. Um, so yes, uh, boilers, HUs. There, uh, we've got, we have got the light sensors that come on and off, but not everywhere. So again, it's a bit confusing. Every now and again, people forget to turn them off again. Um, and interestingly, as as we we're talking this morning, uh, since two thousand and ten, technology has changed, which means that there are now more improvements that we can make in terms of energy efficiency. Just because it's it's, it's as we we're saying this morning, it's an ongoing process, and it it doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't stand still. Uh, so I'm just going to run through a few of the different things that Mac has uh, in order to, uh, the environmental things. Well, first one being solar panels, eco bling, as we said this morning. Um, so we had solar panels installed in December 2011, um, which is a 9.9 .9 kilowatt uh, solar PV system. We've got 55 of the things, and they're on the roof above the gallery. So from here, it's about over there somewhere, um, and they're on pointing towards the park on weighted frames. Um, they generate around uh, 9,000 kilowatt per year, uh, and this is just a quick graph to show you. Obviously, we generate more in the summer. Uh, that's the final quarter for this year. I haven't got the data for that yet. Um, but it's a drop in the ocean compared to what we actually use energy-wise. Um, but uh, in terms of, um, I suppose, being a, a poster thing, just to say, look, we've got these, it's, it's a kind of visible contribution. And in the green alcove in the foyer, we've actually got the solar panel information on. Um, and of course, every little helps, 9,000 kilowatts a year is better than none. Um, something else that was uh, installed during the refurb is the building management system. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, so this is a, a computerized system which controls the air handling units and the heating system. Um, and we set the air handling according to what's in the building. So it's set every week. Um, and the stuff that's in the... Th if there's stuff in the theatre, the air handling's on. If there's nothing in the theatre, the air handling isn't on. So it's to... Um, it, it, in terms of energy efficiency, we only use it when it's needed. And the cinema, of course, as well as the same system. If there's a screening on, we have the air handling on. Um, it's not really working as well as it might possibly do. Um, one of the reasons being is because this is how we control it. This, this is what you get. I've just pulled a screenshot of this just to show you. It's quite clunky. There's lots, instead of a nice little front end system where you kind of go, oh, well, I'd like it at this temperature and you can tweak it. You just end up with lots of different drivers and knobs and switches and things that you have to just put numbers in, um, which means that it's not it's not. It needs a specialist company really to come in and service it, and it becomes that gets quite expensive. Um, there's something like at the moment, the boilers seem to be on all the time, and we're not entirely sure what something in the system is telling them to be on all the time, and we don't know what it is. So, and until we get we spend the money on that specialist company coming to fine tune it and make it work as well as it might, we you know it's not work. But that having said, it's better than not having it. The the system is you know it's a system whereby we can control the plants. Um, I think if, if we didn't have it, we, it would be less energy efficient, but there's a bit of a way to go with it. Um, other environmental improvements we made, LED lighting. Um, so there's a few pictures of the LED lighting here. Um, we've got uh, the galleries, the main gallery space. Uh, so the main gallery, this is a picture of the arena gallery, which is the one that's got the Kersler exhibition at the moment, and the terrace gallery, which is next to the bar where we had lunch. Um, 100 track lights were placed in May 2013. The Hexagon Theatre, those of you who are on the tour, I can wax lyrical about the dimming curve of those lovely GDS systems for a while. It gets very geeky about it. Um, but that was, they were replaced in 2014 um, with help from an eco-business grant. Um, one thing about those is that they're, they're, the system themselves is a lot better. The, 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 those sorts of LEDs, because quite often what you get with LED house lights is that they get to a certain level and then they just snap out. Um, and they, they put people in the dark very quickly and it's really not, not ideal for house lights. So um, the hexagon, the, the, the GDS system doesn't do that. They've got a brilliant dimming curve, which I can get very geeky about. Um, then I, uh, this is the kitchen. I sneaked in and took a picture of the kitchen last week. Um, it was just an in-house. We placed 12 panels with LEDs. It was, it was quite an easy little swap to do. And it saved a maintenance cost because one of the reasons was these were right pain to change. The lamps weren't really difficult to get into the ceiling. So LEDs, a little bit of a no-brainer, really, because they were, 
you know, they're less maintenance, you save on light bulbs, you save energy. Um, the difference being is how to, um, how to fund them. Because there's a lot of areas in Mac uh, where I would really love to change more LEDs. So there's the cinema, for one. I'd love to get the same, same system as in the hexagon. There's the corridor where the Green Lungs exhibition is, ironically. All of, there's, there's not many lights in there, but they're all 70 watt. And it's just like, why have we got this? You know, if we, but it's not as easy as just changing light bulbs over a lot of the time. You need to change the whole fitting. So that's where the funding comes through. Um, the, the foyer lights, I don't know if you noticed, there's these big pendant lights in the foyer. We've got um, 27 of them, I think, and they're 70 watts each, and they're on all the time. So obviously, if we could... But that would be a complete take the unit down, retrofit a different fitting, put it back up again. Um, so as, as much as it would save energy, it's, it's quite a big expense to get there. So working with fundraisers to try and get something in there. Um, those LED improvements, difficult to tell, actually, what effect they had because we're such a multi-use building, because we're open 9 in the morning until 10 at night, 364 days a year, and we have so many different bits. Um, so we're not just a theatre, we're not just a gallery, we're not just a cinema, we're not just a cafe. If you make improvements somewhere, it's quite difficult to measure the impact. Um, but we have started taking some... I've got, I've got a graph for everyone. Look at this. It's nice, exciting, isn't it? Um, so I love a good graph. Um, this is actually something that we started after... Uh, as a response to the create, doing the Creative Dream with Julie's Bicycle and another um, conference that I went on. And this is to take the submeter data so we can look uh, where in the building we're using our energy. Um, and it doesn't exactly measure up, so the it depends on distribution boards, so we can't really tell. But that blue line right at the top is the main plant room where the gallery air handling unit is. And that big nosedive, we had no exhibition in over Christmas for a couple of months, and, that, that, and so we had the air handling unit off. You can see how much energy we use from the air handling unit. There's another line that kind of shoots up. It's sort of like a grey colour, I think. Shoots up and then back down again, and that's the chiller. So that's the chiller with the air handling units, obviously loads of energy in the summer, hardly any energy in the winter. Um, that yellow one's the kitchen. We had a bit of cafe refurbishment. We had the floor redone, shut the cafe for a few days, which never happens. Um, and that's why that big dip comes in. So yeah, it's just interesting to see where in the building we're actually using energy. Surprisingly, I was, I was expecting the theatre dimmer room to have more of a pattern when there were shows in, but it, doesn't, there's, it seems not to impact very much because partly because we're not a producing house, so we're not having production weeks where the theatre lighting's on all the time. It actually, it seems relatively stable, that, that particular one. Anyway, another, another slight graph for you here. Um, I've, I've been saying the words voltage optimization quite a lot over the last year, um, and I know it's been mentioned before by a few people, but I just wanted to explain what it is for people who didn't, who hasn't come across it before. Um, so this graph here, that red line, um, energy comes out of the substation at around about 240 volts. Most equi equipment needs only about 230 volts. No needs about this much. So all of that voltage is wasted. Um, so what we have got, a voltage optimization transformer installed, which is that picture of that really exciting unit on the right-hand side. <laughs> you know, that, that's the glamour of it. This is what I've been talking about for the last year. And get, I finally got, finally got it installed on the 23rd of January. Um, so yeah, what it does is it takes all that extra voltage that you're not using and sends it back to the grid. So you end up you not using that, that energy. And it, um, we're predicted to use, um, to save about 8.5% on our energy bills thanks to that little unit. Um, and also it's meant to prolong the life of equipment as well because, uh, you know, if, if things are getting too much power, they work harder. So it's kind of... So anyway, again bit of a no-brainer. It's supposed to pay itself off, if the predictions are right, uh, in about two and a half years. So um, that installation should start saving us energy and money fairly soon, hopefully, if the predictions are right, eight and a half percent. Um, it's too early to tell. It's only been a month. I've been looking at the graphs. I, was, I like graphs. Um, but yeah, I've been looking at the graphs and going, oh, has it changed? And it does seem to have a difference between this time last year. But um, again, we'll have to keep monitoring it and make sure. Um, the company who put it in is a company called Powerstar, and they're based in Sheffield. Uh, and someone mentioned Power Perfector, which is another company that does a very similar thing. Um, leading on to staff engagement and communication. Um, so, Max got a green group, uh, which I'm a member of, and it is entirely voluntary. 
There's no, you know, there's no requirement to join. It's people who are actually interested. And we've got a lot of people who are very interested, and it's right across the organisation. I think every single department of MAC has a member in the Green Group. Um, we meet um, every couple of months, and it's, it's, a, it's a nice meeting to go to, actually, because it's, it's a free... That's a, it's free for all. But it's... it's um, there's no stupid ideas. If someone wants to come up with an idea, I mean, there's stuff that we come up with and we talk round and we talk about uh, over and over again, one of which being plastic cuffs in the cafe. And, and that's something we've never really found a reasonable solution for because, you know, if you have glasses instead, then you've still got the, the, the washing up uh, environmental impact and, of course, the staff time to collect them and wash them up. Um, and we can't have glass going out into the park because obviously we're just right at the park, so the park rangers get really upset. Um, so... Uh, we're looking at a Mac branded water bottle that they can sell in the, in the shop as well that maybe might encourage people to reuse stuff. But yeah, so occasionally we just don't go around in circles with ideas, but we do keep talking about them. And maybe one of these days someone will come up with a brilliant idea. Um, but it's, it's that sort of thing. Someone once uh, a few years ago was considered having a seed and roof and uh, we looked into it, couldn't really afford it. But you know, it's, 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 a, it's one of those things where Actually, we mentioned rainwater harvesting, so what you were saying was really interesting about you know, whether it would be working or not. But I think a retrofit rainwater harvesting system would be really difficult. Um, so, yes, it's, it's a really good group and a lot of engaged people from across the organisation in it. Um, we, uh, one of the ideas that the ha we had was the green alcove, which is just on the right as you're coming through the main doors. We've got solar panel information, we've got the creative green, pride of place. Uh, we've got a bit of battery recycling. And also we've got this uh, little put a token in a box, how did you get to Mac, which is partly for our data collection, it's a bit of a straw poll, but you know, it's, a, it's, it's partly to, so we know how people are getting to Mac because that data is quite difficult to collect, um, but partly to help people to think about there are other ways to get here other than just driving, even though we have a massive car park outside. Um, another thing we looked at, we had, it, we, we had a little mini environmental festival called EcoFest, uh, which was in August last year. And uh, we invited uh, a few groups to have stalls from around Birmingham. We had, uh, I don't know, Martino Gardens and Growing Wild. And uh, we asked a few people. We did organise it quite late last year. So it was, we only had a few weeks to do it. So this year, we're hoping to hold it in September. And we're going to give us a bit more time to actually get everything together. So, um, But that was, again, a success. Because I, we had someone um, join the Green Group recently who had said at the end of the meeting, I don't believe we're doing all this stuff. We're doing all this stuff and I never knew about it. And that does seem to be a recurring problem where I actually Mac does really well, but struggles to actually communicate that to people. Um, we've got a website page there as well. But yeah, it's, it's quite difficult for us to, to show people the good environment, good environment practice we're doing. So EcoFest was, was a, a start of that and hopefully it's going to be an annual event. And uh, so... Um, that's nice slide, which nice, nice logo of Mac. Um, the three bits of advice that uh, everyone's been asked to give. Uh, my three are um, form a green group. It's really a cross organisation voluntary group because a small group of engaged people can really make a difference. Um, and probably reiterating what's been said this morning again about keeping looking for things. Keep, keep, don't, don't ever think it's a done deal and you've done all you can because you never know when a new bit of funding is going to come along or a new bit of technology is going to come along that you can actually improve things with. And um, just keep going. Like I said, a small, a small group of people um, engaged over a long period of time and you can feel like you're not doing anything and then actually it'll come to something like this where I can say oh look, look at all this stuff we've done actually and, and if, even though it feels like you're standing still, it a little bit at a time really helps a lot. Um, so that's me. Thanks very much. Is this on? Yeah. Thanks, Lizzie. Thanks, Robert. How's that? Okay. Um, so I would like to know if you have any questions. And if you do, can you please also say your name and your organization into the microphone as well? So you both have your hands Hello, hi, I'm Faith from uh, Big Ideas, Tiny Spaces. Um, 
Thank you both for two very good presentations. My question's for Robert. Um, I was just thinking about some of the good things you're doing at the Everyman in, and the small things uh, you called trifles, which did make me slightly hungry, but anyways, <laughs> um, about uh, reminding people to turn off lights and, and some other things. I was wondering, is there any sort of immunity effect after they see the sign two, three, four times, do the people then forget to turn the lights off again? Do they start getting so used to the signs? And I was just yeah. wondering, how had that been handled, or were the maintenance um, crew then just still having to turn all the lights off? Uh, yeah, it, it's absolutely true. You put a sign up and you see it the first two times, and then you start to ignore it. Um, so the, that little label thing we did uh, went up. I've not repeated it. Um, at some point, we will do. Um, but yes, keep trying to shift the idea. Um, so. Uh, the newsletter is quite a useful one. We have with this weekly newsletter. So we, we, for a while, we ran a green corner um, of the newsletter, and just putting different ideas in there. Uh, and, but I find it's much more effective to let those things go for a while, and then bring them back, um, and actually you start re-engaging people again. But yeah, it, it's it, you kind of need to do it, and then find another idea. Thanks, Robert. <clears throat> right, we got there. Okay. Uh, quick hello to Lizzie, uh, local neighbour from the Hippodrome, Kevin Bow, facility supervisor. Uh, for both of you, thank you. It's been been interesting. Uh, I think we we were talking about it earlier. Uh, little things do matter. Uh, if we can get, engage people and get them going, then I think that don't be despondent, but just carry on with it. Uh, we had a silly little one on turning light switches off. Um, we, we actually put um, labels inside that uh, were luminous inside the room, and people liked to, to turn the light off because they could see the label light up. Um, um, so. Uh, if you can please people, please them. Uh, the, the other one, we haven't got a green team. Not at our level. We've probably got it director level and above and communications being what they are. Don't know what comes down, what moves around you. You don't seem to get it. So I think we need to, to produce that. The, the map being such um, people friendly, do you actually... Um, produce a green team for the outside world? Do, do people actually want to do anything to come in and have a green meeting with the MAC or, or anything like that? Um, that's an interesting one. Not as far as I'm aware. I, first of all, I'd reiterate I have, I have a green team at all levels because, I mean, just the, the people who work on a day-to-day -day basis then and just having that sort of level playing field or anything, it's great. But um, I think... Uh, I mean, we have engaged with the Wildlife Trust, um, Michelle touched on it this morning in the introduction, where we've got that area out on the terrace where we're looking to fundraise and develop that into something that looks slightly nicer and also has a basis with the Wildlife Trust on wildlife. And we do talk to our neighbours, Sustainability West Midlands, Northville Eco Centre we've had uh, contact with. Um, and uh, we, uh, we're going to be very soon inviting people back for our for EcoFest. Um, for you know to have a stall and tell people about the sustainable work so in terms of green community we we do talk to people and we'd welcome talking to people a bit more but in terms of an actual external group i don't think there's been many interests in that as far as i know <laughs> tell me about the bees <laughs> uh, they're little buzzy things um, we have uh, I don't know we'll have about 60,000 of them on the roof at the moment um, they are a commitment um, the, the, we've, we, we've just done a bit of training um, because we're starting to think about um, from springtime we need to start actively managing them again um, through the winter pretty much you kind of check they're okay, but you don't open the hives up or anything like that. So we've had a sort of fallow period, and we're just thinking about open, uh, 
getting back into the um, system. So we've just done a bit of training on swarming um, and how you handle that. So there is quite a lot involved. Um, what's been nice is we've out, actually found that a couple of the staff have really got very interested in it and they now naturally kind of lead the, the B group. Um, but say, doing it in the first place, the, the best thing I, I think I can recommend is go and find your local beekeepers. Um, they are quite a friendly, if sometimes slightly odd bunch. Um, they tend to be quite committed to their bees, um, but they are always very willing to share. So we found um, local beekeepers. Um, we now have a couple of them who kind of act as our mentors. Um, you know, if we've got queries, we can phone them up and they'll come and help us. Um, they organise the training, organise certification of, uh, of the basic training and all that sort of thing for us. Um, it, don't be disappointed if you don't get honey. <laughs> um, I'd, say, I'd be devastated. Well, <laughs> it, yeah, the whole point is we're not doing it for honey. We're doing it because we want, we, we want it for the ecology of the area. Um, interestingly, where we are in a very urban environment, um, we are surrounded by beekeepers. Um, so we actually now have lots of new friends that we've discovered um, through doing this. I mean, we knew about Blackburn House, which is um, uh, our centre just down the road from us, education centre just around the road from us. We knew that they had beehives, and I went and saw them when we were first thinking about it. Uh, they introduced us to other people. The cathedral, um, Anglican Cathedral, has bees. Uh, quite a few private houses along the street uh, where we are have bees, and the universities. So we now regularly exchange information um, between all of us. Do they ever swarm over your customers? Sorry? Do they ever swarm over your customers? So do they, do they swarm anywhere near your customers? Have uh, you ever had like, customers coming in covered in bees? <laughs> no. It, it, interestingly, there is, this, there is this idea that your, your bees won't land near you. Um, they, when they go off to forage, they go away, away. Um, we've had swarms. We don't think they were our bees. We were 99% convinced they, they came from somewhere else. Um, we've had our hive swarm as well. Um, so this is a point where a queen will go off with half the hive. Um, we've had that happen. We've lost half the hive. Um, but actually, we've, we managed to carry on. Uh, we started one hive and now got three. Um, but so far, uh, two years in, we've had no honey. Can I just um, add a comment on bees? We're working with a lot of organisations now that have their urban beekeepers, and some of which are actually selling their own honey. I think the thing about um, bees, it's something which makes sustainability really real and relevant for people. And it helps them to make the link between the importance of the bee, the importance of stopping the use of pesticides and the importance of bees in the food chain. And I think that's a really key thing in getting people engaged on sustainability. It's that seeing is believing. A lot of organizations, um, the Young Vic, which is here today, they have, um, uh, food growing um, and community gardening and again it's a way of making sustainability feel real for people and sometimes also engaging with the community so I think that's a really important thing about it as well. One quick question, uh, Francine Dulong, co-artistic director of Blooming Ludus. Um, if you, the bees are obviously one, as we're talking about making the invisible visible, one really good concrete way. Regardless of funding, if you could have any project for your organizations that would make the work that you do more visible to the public, what would it be? Or any tiny ideas, tiny ideas that you've talked about with your, with your groups and your staff members? So you mean like what, what? the dream project would be. Yeah, would it be some, some crazy augmented reality screen on the wall that has all these amazing graphs on it? Would it, would it, would it be compost toilets? Would it be, I don't know, what, what could it be? Um, my dream, and don't, don't repeat this outside this room because I'll be in trouble. Um, yeah, I will. Um, is to convince the powers that be in the organisation to really commit. Um, we are, I have to say, they're not singling out our organisation for this, but there are an awful lot of people who are very good at talking the talk environmentally, but actually will not 
do what's necessary to make it happen. So that, that would be my dream, is actually get the commitment from everyone in the organisation um, to, to do things. Um, and that comes down to little things like, we have lots of these wonderful, sustainable things in the building that we really wanted to shout about when we opened the building. And one of the ways of doing that is actually, you know, only you've got a, a, a tap that switches itself off, is to put a little label to say that um, next to the tap. Also, it helps to tell people how to switch the damn thing on, because it may not be immediately um, uh, obvious. Uh, and things like that, clutter, uh, was a big no-no. Um, so a lot of the things that we ought to be shouting about, we haven't. The thing I did manage to go through, which I actually cut the slide in the end, um, we've, we, uh, for Briam, you have to talk about the, the sustainability things that you're doing um, to be able to get a, a Briam point for communication. Um, and the way that I decided to do that, knowing the um, fear and dread people have about anything signage and boards cluttering the place up and things, I said, OK, we're going to have a screen for this. Uh, it is actually a touch screen. We don't have it interactive yet. That's kind of the next stage. Um, but on that, I'm updating regularly the information about what we're doing um, for s sustainability. That's on the main stairs. You come in, when you come through the foyer. When you're going up to the auditorium, you can't miss it. It's there. That was a big argument as well to get it there. Um, but it need, that's, that's the kind of thing. But yeah, so my, my, my dream doesn't cost much money. It's just getting buy-in. Uh, yeah, I mean, there'd be some great big projects. I mean, the seeding roof would be amazing. There's some, there, that LED lighting, again, amazing to have, you know, all that sort of thing. But it is staff engagement when it comes down to just trying to get staff to put things in the right bin. <laughs> <laughs> and people just don't. <laughs> I mean, we have all the nice, you know, labelled recycling bins. No, still, it's, you know, and of course, if a bin bag's contaminated with something that isn't recycled, it gets lobbed in the general waste. Yeah, so I think just engaging people engaging everybody is, is a difficult one because we have, like I said, we've got a great green group and we've got lots of really well engaged people um, but some people just don't get it yet and I don't know how to, how to get that through to them really. Thank you for that question and um, we'll just take one last question at the back. Hello, um, I'm Phil Holyman from Little Earthquake. Um, we've talked a lot today about what buildings can do and should do and what venue staff can do and should do but what can companies do who use your spaces and use your buildings to make work or tour work um uh, we did talk about there's julie's bicycle thing with it called green rider which if you go on their website they've got a uh, a template for and we did look at doing that the other way around so we did look at putting something in the dressing rooms to say to companies think about where you put in your rubbish think about um, the energy you use think about turning lights off but actually it doesn't really work very well the other way around um, because it's it's just quite obvious and not very much to say about it um, I think it's to do with the work a lot of the time we've had we've got the Greenland lungs exhibition we've got another quite interesting one coming up in the autumn called the hot project in terms of exhibitions. Um, we had a show in over Christmas called Where's My Igloo Gone, which was a uh, co-production with a local company called Bone Ensemble, who was about a, um, it was a, a, how to explain climate change to young children, and they didn't use any language either. They invented a language called Igluish. It was quite a difficult sell, and they, they really did do a great job. It was it's a nice show, it's still touring, I think. Um, and the bear, I think it's, I think, what can companies do when they're in the building is the same as what anybody else can do, same as what staff members do, same as what the public do, and, and level of awareness. But I think the artistic insight of that is actually making work which reflects it, I suppose. Not being a, a creative, usually. Yeah, I think we, we, at the moment, don't have a green ride or anything like that, but it's, it's actually there's a whole raft of work that we need to do looking at procurement and and things like that as well. And I think that's one of the things we'll, that we will pick up as we, as we kind of go through those paperwork type things. Um, we obviously, a large part of, of getting companies into the building is actually developing a relationship and finding out about their work. So we will look at companies who think about these things and, and we will have a natural affinity to working with those companies. The one thing that we don't do is 
um, go out and commission writers to write pieces about environmental sustainability. Um, we kind of shy away from that because we don't think the best work comes out of doing things like that. Um, what we do find is that by, I mean, very interestingly, the, uh, when we were talking about the, uh, the, the new everyman, um, amongst all the um, consultation work we were doing with, with peers was talking to the writers that we work with. And actually out of that, one of our writers went away and was actually thinking about bees and things and wrote a piece that, uh, that was based around um, thinking about the survival of bees. Um, so it tends to be um, trying to find ways of, of actually interesting people uh, in the idea and actually then letting them go away and come back with something um, for us. And some of the organisations that we've been working with as well have done things like um, include sustainability in um, contracts with freelance workers. I think especially a lot of organisations now are using more and more freelance creative staff as well um, and ways of doing that. Other ways we've seen are um, bringing sustainability into induction or welcome sessions um, at the National Theatre. They did a whole um, day of workshops with creative cr collaborators to ask them what they thought and what they thought they could do and what sustainability meant to them. So I think, you know, depending on who you are and what you do, it's, it's finding the right approach, but integrating it into what you're already doing with incoming artists, collaborators, organisations, and trying to have that integrated approach seems to be quite um, successful. Um, we co-produce all the time and um, there seems to be a kind of, if you have to Skype, it's like it's not a real meeting and it drives us all mad because people travel all over the country to sit and have a cup of coffee um, face to face and that's something we've got to change as an industry because we all work together in partnership all the time, not just in theatre. Um, and so well, we're, you know, we, we'll Skype with people merrily if they're in America, but somehow if they're in Newcastle, we have to go and see them. It's crazy. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, especially Lizzie and Robert. That was really interesting, and thank you for your questions and comments. I think just to sum up, I would say um, we have been talking a lot about the importance of the little things, but what I would say is that you need both the big and the little. You need to invest where you can in your building. You need to engage people, to empower people to take the small steps but you do need that framework and that commitment from the top of your organisation and support to really achieve that long-term change. Thanks. So we... Yes, please do touch. <laughs> Uh, we have a coffee break now until uh, 16.40 and then the final panel session is going to happen here on partnerships and financing. Um, two last things, please do have a look at our Fit for the Future guide on our website. There's a lot of information in there and a lot of case studies in particular. Um, and the last point is, if anybody is leaving now, leaving earlier, please do remember to fill out the feedback form before you go. That's your incentive to stay. <laughs>